excited to worship Jesus? Anybody excited to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Yes, Lord. Yeah. It says, wandering into the night. Yeah. And wanting a place to hide this weary soul. Yes, Lord. This bag of bones. Scan with the fine, I'm slowly drifting. Oh, bag of bones. All together, we sing it just when I, and just, just when, when I. church family. How are we doing this morning? All right. So we are excited. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are here the Sunday after Easter. We are equally as excited about celebrating today as we were last week. Listen, so I uh, just wanted to uh, share something with you all. Um, actually, you can be seated here for just a minute. wanted to share a couple things. Um, but the first one being, so y'all didn't know this, but we actually had a secret meeting where we were talking about moving our church to the Midwest, right? Well, we realized we couldn't pick up the whole building and move it to the Midwest, so we brought the Midwest to us, all right? So, right? Yeah. So uh, we will have uh, this wonderful setting up because 
This is the perfect segue to let you know why it's up because our school, Northside Christian School, is hosting a musical, The Music Man. Now, listen, I'm, I know coming from me, I love theater. I grew up doing theater and stuff, so I've got a little bit of a bias, but I'm telling you, this is a wonderful show. If you have not done so already, make sure you get tickets. Listen, if you want to get tickets today for the musical, come right out to the Connect Desk over here between doors 7 and 8, and we can pull it up on the internet, and we can pull it up on our app, and we can go ahead and get those tickets for you today and get them today. Um, also, if you're new here, uh, we would love it to get a chance just to meet you face-to-face get some information from you so that we can stay in touch with you. So be sure that you head out between door seven and eight on your way out, stop by the connect desk. We'll have some friends out there that would love the chance to meet you. Also want to tell you this summer, we have a lot of opportunities that are going to come up for us as a church family to connect with each other um, and to connect in some uh, cool events that are happening. So we should have our summer calendar complete and finalized for next week, which you can pick up a copy of that to take with you, but we've got some stuff planned. But part of that, part of our summer plans are going to be camps. Now, I, I want to share a little bit of uh, kind of my personal story with this. Um, so uh, I remember going to camp uh, in fifth grade. Um, in fifth grade, I remember, actually, it was in Lake Wales, Lake Aurora Camp. I know some of you here have been there before. But I sat around a campfire, and uh, that was the moment when I decided to give my life to full-time ministry. And I'll tell you what, um, God called me to that, and it was really neat seeing as my life went along, that call never went away. So listen, for those of you that have kids, for those of you that are kids, these opportunities to go to these camps over the summer are, are so, they can shape so much of who you are and who you become. So please don't miss out on those opportunities to connect with us over the summer. Listen, again, we are so grateful that you're here today. We are so grateful that you decided to join us today in worship. Why don't you guys please stand as we continue on in worshiping through music. Nothing can, can stop our, come on, 
and you shine in the shadow. We're singing to our God. You win every battle. Hey, nothing can stand again. Come on, in Almighty Fortress, Almighty. Come on, you go before us. You go before. Nothing can stand. Nothing can stand against the power. for us and he is a holy God and we sing unto him this morning
Church family, you can be seated. So we want to continue right now in a time of worship um, as we we look into giving. Um, and, and we do look at giving here as an act of worship. Um, this is not just that point in the time where we break off and just, you know, talk about money for a little bit. This is about giving. And giving is not just resources. Um, giving can, is about our time and our talents and our energy and our passions. And we look for opportunities within the church, within our community, within the people that we know to invest those things. Um, I'll tell you a very practical way that you can invest in the ministries here at Northside Baptist is if you walk outside, you'll see there are some very large game pieces. There's a giant Uno card, which I want to play a game of Uno with that size Uno card. It seems like it'd be super fun. Um, but anyway, on there, you'll see little cards that have uh, items that need to be purchased for VBS. Um, we are doing a VBS this summer. It'll be in June. And so we actually look to our church family to help us with some of the supplies for that. So on your way out today, um, if you want to, like I said, just walk by, you'll see a big board and a bunch of things taped on it, so you can actually take one of those. So I'm actually going to ask my friends to come forward here with the buckets um, as we get ready to uh, collect our giving right now. Um, you'll notice that there's also some QR codes on the back of your seats if you'd like to give online. Um, you can also give on our app. You can come into the office and give throughout the week, um, whichever way you're looking at it. And again, um, it's not about just, you know, kind of randomly throwing money into, uh, you know, a black hole and hoping that something happens happens. Like know that every dollar that we get, every cent that we get goes to invest in the ministry of Northside Baptist Church. And the ministries at Northside Baptist include everything from serving our community through our food pantry um, to creating a, a, a program like a VBS to put on over the summer to teach young kids about Jesus, because um, that's a huge undertaking. Um, but those are where your that's where the giving goes. So just know um, each Sunday when we get up to talk about this right now as we're talking about this, it's the idea that that you are investing in what God is doing here. And listen, if you're new here, we're actually not gonna ask that you give anything. Just you being here today is a gift to us. The only gift that we ask from you is again, you stop by our Connect Desk on the way out so we have a chance to meet you a little bit better. Um, if you guys would like to, uh, if you wanna join me right now, I'm gonna pray over our offering um, and then we'll continue on in worship. God, thank you so much for this morning. Um, God, I thank you for the celebration that we had last week uh, as we celebrated the resurrection of your son, Jesus. But God, we know that last Sunday is not the only day we celebrate that, but we celebrate that every single day. And God, we are grateful for how you're moving in and through Northside Baptist Church. We are grateful for the people that, that show up here on Sundays, that show up here throughout the week to be involved in community, um, that are invested into the mission of Northside Baptist Church that you are continuing to bless. God, I pray that uh, throughout this week, you give us opportunities to be a light for you in our community and in our world. God, I pray that uh, you take the giving that was uh, provided today and throughout this week and that you multiply it. God, I pray um, that as we look at our budgets and as we look at what our ministries are, God, that we don't just see numbers there. We don't just see uh, just the, the boundaries that we have to live in, but that we see um, that those are opportunities for people to step up and support the mission that's here, God. And, and to not be discouraged by that, but to know that you show up in big, awesome, huge ways. God, we love you. Uh, we ask these things uh, today in the name of your son, Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we, we ask these things, amen. All right, will you all stand one more time? Uh, we've got one last song to do, uh, so please join our band as we continue on in worship. Church, as we begin to reflect on this next song, it talks about the goodness of God, and it's a song that we sing all the time. I just really begin to think about how, how in every single season, God has remained faithful. Can anybody attest to that? That in every season of your life, in, that, in everything, that seemed, that everything that seemed to go wrong, and everything that seemed to, to be bad, every single thing that seemed to hurt you, and every single uh, valley and every single mountaintop, God has been consistent. As we, were as we were in rehearsal this morning, we were just singing, and I started just to reflect on the goodness of God. So before you sing, would you, just, would you just close your eyes and just begin to reflect on the goodness of God in your life, how good he's been to you, how he's kept you, 
The Bible says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. He is good. That is his character. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Before you're seated, before you're seated, turn to at least three or four people, say hello, good morning, and welcome.
Good morning, church. Good morning, good morning. Did you make your way back to your seats? It just dawned on me a few minutes ago, just, I don't know, 10 minutes ago, um, thinking about the set here. Has anybody seen the movie Field of Dreams? Yes. So they say, Ray, Ray, is this heaven? No, it's Iowa. So I think I'm standing in Iowa, at least this morning, the backdrop. I've actually been to Iowa. Has anybody else been to Iowa? Anybody from Iowa? We'll pray for you. Um, <laughs> Iowa was great. <laughs> Good morning, church. My name is Chad. Allow me to be one of the first to say welcome to the FOB. This is the forward operating base of the soldiers of the Lord's Army who are stationed right here at Northside Church in April of 2023. And it's as we gather at the FOB each and every single week, we are equipped, trained, and then sent out on mission, sent out to do the work of the Almighty God, to, to carry the mission, or uh, the way that I would tell it to my baseball team, actually, quite literally, to carry the fight to the enemy. And it's not a fist fight, it's a battle, it's a spiritual battle every single day because we have an enemy who is waging war against us. I hope somebody knows that this morning. And in that battle, in that, that war, as we are trained at the FOB, as we are the soldiers at the forward operating base, when we leave this place, whether you're watching online or you're in this room this morning, we are equipped, we're trained. We go out with the armor of God, Ephesians 6. We go out with the power of the truth of God that's in our heart, Psalm 109, Psalm 119. And we walk out these doors victorious, not because we heard a good message or sang some good songs, but because the power of the living God is dwelling in us. And we walk in that power every single day. So allow me to say welcome to FOB Northside. This morning, it's, it's simply the question. We're starting a three-week series that will last for the rest of this month. There are five Sundays in the month of April. So for the next three weeks, we're going to be in a series simply called What's Next? Very basic, very plain, but it makes sense after Easter. So Easter is this big celebration. The church comes together. Everybody in the world knows it's Easter. We gather together on, on Easter Sunday morning. We hear the word. We enjoy uh, time with one another, family, friends, etc. So then we ask the question, what's next? Very simply, what's next? So this morning and for the next three weeks, we're going to recenter ourselves and use the Bible as our guide and simply ask the question of, okay, Lord, now that we've celebrated Easter, again, we, we understand in context as believers of Jesus, we celebrate Easter every day, every moment of our lives. But last Sunday, specifically, we celebrated Easter Sunday morning. So now we say, well, what's next for us? Or we just look at the Bible and see what happened actual, actually the day after the first Easter. Easter or the day of the first Easter when Jesus was resurrected. So here's a real quick summary or overview about what happened right after Easter. So follow along in your minds. If you want to go to Matthew 28, you can, but really the place you need to go is James chapter four. We'll be there momentarily. What happened after Easter? Well, Jesus walked out of his grave. Come on, somebody wake up. Jesus was resurrected. He came back to life. He is the risen son of the almighty God. Matthew 28, 6 says, he is not here for he has risen just as he said he was going to do. And then we know the lies began to happen among the people there in that story, Matthew 28, 15, of the, the, the lies that were pre that really that the people were taught to tell these lies about what really happened. We know Matthew 28, 15 says, and that story has spread among the Jews to this very day meaning the story of the lies of the fact that Jesus didn't rise from the dead, that Jesus wasn't resurrected, that something must have happened. That story was, was propagated, but then we see in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, the great commission of Jesus. Jesus speaks to his disciples in a room together, and Jesus says these words in Matthew 28, 18. He came unto them and said, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples." Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I will be with you until the end of the age. Come on, somebody. That's a promise from Jesus. He's with us. Hebrews 13, 5, he will never leave us nor forsake us. So what Jesus does in Matthew 28 is he gives us his mission, his vision for what's next. What did the disciples do or, or what the disciples did is precisely what we are to continue to do in April of 2023 right here at Northside. So what we find is Jesus gave his disciples his mission. What's the mission? This is what you need to do, Jesus says, go and make disciples. 
Well, how do we do that? What's the vision of that? Jesus says, here's how you do it. Teach them to observe everything that I've already taught you. Teach them to observe the truth. Teach them to obey the commandments that I've already given to you. And behold, I am with you. I will be there with you in all of your efforts. So mission, make disciples. Vision, teach people about Jesus. Speak the gospel. Jesus says, I will be with you in all things. So let's pause here for just a second before we get to James 4 and where we're actually going this morning. As we think about Jesus' mission and vision, we think about practically Northside's mission and vision. Northside's mission to make disciples of Jesus Christ, both here and abroad. It's somewhere over there on that wall. I can't see it because uh, there's something right there. I don't want to tell you what that is, but it's something that's important for the play. Is that a house? What is it? It doesn't matter. It's a house or something. Mission Make disciples of Jesus Christ both here and abroad. Vision to reach the now generation with the gospel of Jesus Christ while navigating a rapidly changing culture. How do we do that? We teach people to observe all that Jesus has commanded. How do we navigate a rapidly changing culture? We don't do it by falling into the trap of culture. We do it by speaking the truth into culture. Is anybody awake? And so Jesus says, here's the mission, here's the vision, go and make disciples. So now the question remains for us, okay, what's next? So over the next three weeks, we're actually going to work our way through the rest of the book of James. We started James, gosh, I think back in October, paused in December, paused in January, paused in February, came back to it in March, and we're in James, the middle of James chapter 4, and we're going to finish it over the next three weeks in April, and we're going to talk about what's next, and we're going to see these three primary things over the next three weeks. We're going to see what our perspective on the mission should be, that's today, our perspective on the mission. Next week, we're going to see that we must have patience in this mission. And week three, we're going to talk about what it means to really genuinely pray for the mission that God has for us. So I would say to you as your pastor this morning, buckle your pew belts and hang on. James chapter four, what is our perspective on the mission? This morning, we're going to see three things from James four, 11 through 17. The first thing we're going to see is we must be truth talkers. Second thing we're going to see is we must be time tellers. You say, come on, Chad, you're so corny. Well, I, I'm doing the best I can. Number three, we must be teachable teachers. First thing about our perspective on the mission before we get to James 4 and read it. Understand this. A perspective is simply this. It's a way of thinking or regarding something. It's a particular attitude or a point of view that we have about something. That's called perspective. So a week ago, just for a tangible example here, my perspective was that the Rays were going to go undefeated and win 162 games. <laughs> you see, our perspectives sometimes get off track. But when we are reminded of the mission, when we're reminded of the vision of Jesus Christ, we're always reminded of the proper perspective for believers. This morning, James chapter 4, follow with me in your Bible, verse 11. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks evil against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Let's pause there for point number one. This morning, church, we must be truth talkers. Here's a question. Why is speaking the truth, the real, biblical, God-honoring truth, why is speaking the truth so difficult for us in 2023? If you will allow me to posit an answer here, it's both personal for me, and it's also hopefully somewhat well-researched in my life, but also in ministry. Here's my initial answer. The reason it's so hard to speak the truth to people in April of 2023 is because we have unintentionally and sometimes intentionally, in many cases, we've created a culture of sissies. <laughs> Write that one down. Write that one down. Here's what I mean. It's because we've fallen into the trap of thinking that if we tell someone something that they don't want to hear, they're going to be angry at us. They're going to get mad at us. They're going to start an online fight or a, a group text. They're going to be offended. Then they're no, no longer going to speak to us in public. They're going to, in the car line at Northside, they're going to go the opposite direction over to the elementary school, and they're going to avoid you because we're so worried if we just speak the truth that people are going to freak out and get offended all the while. All the things that people get offended by in this world today, are, they're offended by everything except for sin and except for the truth of God's word. 
But the problem is we fall into that because it's so easy because we've allowed people, we, I didn't say you, we have allowed people so much access to our lives through our own social medias. I mean, if I, if, if I really wanted to, I could share every part of my life on social media. My followers would plummet to like 10, but still yet, I could do it, right? We all have that tendency. And so what happens is we worry if we speak the truth that somebody's going to post something about us or comment on a post about us and say something that will perhaps embarrass us. And then we fall into the trap of worrying more about, about the people around us or about the way we are perceived, worrying if our names might be tarnished or thrown under the bus instead of worrying about if we simply speak the truth in love. More specifically in James chapter 4, look at what James is pointing to here. He says this, when people get upset, they start talking about other people and judging other people. They start rumors, start falsely accusing others to make themselves look better. Church, let me me pause here for a practical opportunity. If you never experienced that in your life, I have an opportunity for you. And here's what I'm talking about. People that point fingers and cast the blame on others and always try to put other people down and make themselves look better. If you need a practical opportunity, here's what you do. Go borrow someone's seventh grade student. And I say that with all sincerity. I'm not saying that because I have a seventh grader. I love him most of the time. I love him. No, unconditionally, I love him. But in seventh grade, there's this weird dynamic. Are there any seventh grade teachers in the room? Praise God for you. There's this weird, weird dynamic. It's the whole pubescent issues, identity crises, and the first answer from almost any question that you ask a seventh grader, and by the way, I, don't know, I have one at home, it's our third, but I have 30 of them that call me coach, it's immediately, immediately somebody else's fault. It's immediately that guy's fault or mama's fault or daddy's fault. It's immediately the teacher's fault, the principal's fault, the bus driver's fault. It's immediately somebody else's fault. That's the culture that a seventh grader lives in, but reality is this morning, adults in this room, that's a culture we all live in. And the, the, the temptation is to fall into the trap of pointing fingers and speaking evil about other people. As James says here in James chapter 4, what naturally happens is we begin to speak evil of others to try and protect ourselves and make ourselves look better. But look at what James says in verse 11. He says, do not speak evil one another, brothers, against one another, brothers. This word of, of evil or speaking evil there, this, this, the two words together come from the Greek, it's a long word. I don't know what it's, how to say it, but here's a Greek word. It's simply this. It's the sin of those who gather in little groups, little text messaging groups, little social media groups, little groups in Starbucks or wherever else. They gather together and they pass on either confidential information or information that's not true in these groups. It destroys the other person's name and they begin to speak evil about others and then that gets traction and the evil speaking, the untruth, actually becomes truth in the culture because it's the narrative that's heard the most often. Instead, this sin of speaking evil, it begins to fester itself. It begins to grow And then the truth begins to wane and to fade away. All the while, the Bible is reminding us that when we speak evil of one another, and and again, we're going to balance this here in a minute, but when we speak evil of one another because of a reaction to something or because we don't like something or perhaps it's not our preference, when we begin to do this, this is sinful for two reasons. First and foremost, it breaks the royal law of God that we should love one another, the great commandment. Has anybody ever heard the great commandment this morning? Matthew 22, what's the great commandment? Jesus says this. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, but the second one is just like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Church, this morning, remember this. Speaking evil of another is opposed to the great commandment. Speaking truth fulfills the great commandment. Speaking evil of one another is opposed to the great commandment, but speaking truth fulfills the great commandment. If we truly love the Lord with all our heart, then the truth will come out. I need to say that twice. If we truly love the Lord with all our heart, then the truth will come out. Matthew 12, 34, Jesus says this, for out of the abundance of the heart does the mouth, what? Speak. 
So if we love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and we have his truth in our heart and his desires in our heart, if we're empowered by his spirit that's dwelling in us every single moment, Romans 5.5, 5, that the spirit of God that's been poured into our hearts through the power of Christ Jesus. If we're walking in his truth, if we're obeying his commands, if we're living out the great commandment, then out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. And when the mouth speaks, if it's true, and if it's God's word, and if it's based on the principles of God's truth, then we don't need to worry about if people are going to be offended or if our name is going to be tarnished. We need to worry about whether we're honoring God in our speech. The Bible actually teaches us that this is what the church is supposed to do in Ephesians 4. There's a lot there in Ephesians 4, but... Part of the church's role is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, to build up the body of Christ so that we can attain unity and faith, knowledge of the Son of God, mature manhood, so that we can, we can come to the fullness of Christ, so that we're no longer children that are tossed to and fro by every wave and wind of doctrine, right? But, and, and then Ephesians 4.15 says, but rather, here's what the church should do, speaking the truth in love. Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body is being joined and held together. Every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, it makes the entire body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So church, what James is not saying is that we can't speak truth to one another, even when it hurts. What he is saying, he's warning us about speaking evil against a brother, especially, or a sister, when you've not talked to them personally, when you've gathered in your own little huddle over here and you're talking evil about them because maybe whatever's going on in their life actually has something to do with your life and then you're speaking evil about them so it makes you look good. Oh, me and also amen. Practical illustration. Last week, a good friend of mine was in town and there's something he says to me very often. He was here visiting. He's a missions or part of a missions organization, Ricky Gross, and I had the privilege of going and being part of a meeting on Thursday, I guess it was, for this, this just wonderful missions group that just is doing God's work all over the world, and it would be amazing if we could share all those stories, and we'll share more at some point. But, but back to the point of this, the, the guy, my friend, who's like the leader of this, this missions organization, he says a phrase to me re- relatively often, probably monthly, if not even every other week, He says this to me. He says, Chad, always remember, you're three seconds from stupid. (laughs) He texts it to me. He tells me on the phone. He tells me in person. What does he mean by that? It means that I'm three seconds from doing something stupid that will cause me to potentially lose my ministry, lose my family, lose my impact, lose my mission for Christ of making disciples, lose my my ability to speak truth to, to other people. So why do I bring this up? Because if my friend didn't love me, he wouldn't tell me that. But he reminds me of that all the time because he says, Chad, you're a pastor. You have a congregation. You got a school over there. You got a baseball team. You got a family. You got four kids. You've got all this stuff in your life. Do you not understand that you're three seconds from being an idiot and wasting all of that? You see, that's truth talking because he loves me and he's not afraid to say, Chad, watch your life. Chad, follow Jesus. Chad, read the word. Chad, study the truth. Chad, pray for your family. Chad, pray for your church. You're three seconds away from being an idiot and throwing it all away. But he tells me, Chad, guard your heart. Guard your heart. He doesn't say, Chad, you're the greatest preacher I've ever heard. He doesn't say, Chad, man, Northside's so lucky to have you. He says, Chad, you're three seconds from stupid. In other words, what I tell my team all the time, he says, Chad, get your mind right. Get your mind right. He speaks the truth in love to me so that I don't think too highly of myself, so that I don't think I'm invincible or that I'm, you know, whatever. He helps me understand that I'm 1,000% capable of doing something dumb. And the reason that that's important is he doesn't dodge the fact that I'm a human and that I have the ability to do bad things. He speaks directly to my heart, directly to my face. It says, Chad, watch your walk. Chad, watch your talk. You see, this is not him being judgmental to me. This is him being my friend and saying, Chad, you need to get your mind right. You need to walk in the ways of the Lord. And if I take offense to that, that's not his fault. That's my own immaturity. You see, truth talk is when you look someone in the eye and you say, this is what the word of God says. 
Secondly, the reason that speaking evil is such a a sinful act, first of all, it breaks the great commandment of God, but second of all, it takes God's right judgment away from God, and then we try to place it upon ourselves. Church, understand, God is the ultimate judge. 2 Timothy 4.1, it says that, I charge you, Timothy, or Paul says to Timothy, in the presence of God in Christ Jesus, Jesus is the one who is to judge the living and the dead. You see, when we start passing judgment on other people, we are usurping God's role and we're inserting ourselves into the role that the Almighty God has. Jesus reminds us, Matthew 7, judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged and the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye when you got a big old log sticking out of your own? Jesus reminds us of this great truth. He says, first, take the speck out of your, or the log out of your eye, then you can remove the speck from somebody else's. Here's a point of clarification, church, real quickly before we get to point number two. Points two and three are half as long as point number one. So you got that going for you. Point of clarification. This does not mean that we can't speak truth to any person. Precisely, it means that the ultimate judgment is God's role. We are simply messengers of his truth. We're not the judges, if you will, of life. We're the people who are to speak truth in every context, even if it hurts, even if it's not tickling to the ears. We speak the truth of God's word. We speak it with love and compassion and umption and gumption. We speak it knowing that it's not our role to change somebody, but it's the power of the Almighty God through the power of his word, through the power of his Holy Spirit. He does the work. All we are is me are messengers of it. So when we speak the truth, we're not doing so in a judgmental way. We're doing so because the truth has been spoken to us. Is anybody awake this morning? Practical application to point number one. The best way to stop speaking evil and falsely judging others is to simply have clarity. Have clarity. Don't fall into the trap of saying, well, I heard this about so-and-so. Or somebody told me that she did this and he did that. Or I heard this. No, no, no. Have clarity. <laughs> Mr. Elam does a really good job at this school. Before I get to point number two, he says this. I've heard him say it a hundred times. He says, I won't start listening to your, to your story until you give me a name. Meaning, I'm not just going to listen to a bunch of nonsense, or he said, she said. Give me a name. If it's an issue, we'll deal with it with truth. If not, I'm done with the conversation because I don't need more gossip. Lord knows I don't need more gossip in my life. Is anybody with me this morning? Speak the truth. Speak it pointedly. Speak it with clarity. Church ambiguity always leads to gossip and evil speaking. James says, do not speak evil of your brothers. Point number one, we must be truth talkers. Point number two, we must be time tellers. Look at verse 14, 13. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, well, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this and do that. Church, we must be time tellers. Verse 14, James is, is saying, basically, I love what I, I think Charles Spurgeon originally said this, and you'll see the quote on your screen in front of you. There are two certainties about things that will come to pass. One, God knows. Two, we don't. God knows. We don't. The idea here that our life is a vapor, a mist, or a shadow. Actually, we find that in the Old Testament. This is a figure of speech that the Old Testament authors used over and over. They compared our lives to a shadow, Psalm 102. My days are like an evening shadow. Job chapter 8, for our days on earth are like a shadow. First Chronicles 29, 15, our days on the earth are like a shadow. Just like a shadow appears while the sun is up and then vanishes at night, so is the biblical picture of life. I've said this so many times recently. I know that the, the recent studies are that, you know, the average American lives like above the age of 80 now. 80 years. Seems like a long time. But if that's the truth for me, there's more sand in the bottom of my hourglass than there is in the top. <laughs> it's just true. I mean, I'm 43. Let's do the math, right? 43, 37 to 80. Here's the perspective. James says, if you live to be 80 or 180, like some of them dudes in the Old Testament, your life's a shadow. Sun comes up, you see the shadow, sun goes down, it's gone. 
Your life is a mist. It's a vapor. It appears for a moment in time and then poof, it vanishes away. Just like a shadow or a mist, church, this is our perspective about time, about life, about the mission that Jesus has for us. The reason we need a clear perspective of the mission and we need a clear perspective of time to be time tellers, if you will, is because we need to understand that our life is not promised tomorrow. We're not promised tonight. We're not promised 10 years from now. But what we are promised is the breath that we're breathing right now. And while we're breathing this breath, we're on mission for Christ. We're speaking truth for Jesus. We're walking in his ways. We're abiding in him, and we're saying, Lord Jesus, use us while ever we have time remaining. Church, this is not morbid. This is actually incredibly, overwhelmingly joyful. Imagine if you didn't have hope. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, we said it last week, if we didn't have hope for eternity, we, of the most people, we would, should be pitied. But we do have hope. This is not morbid. This is not me up here talking about dying tomorrow, or the next week, or the next day, whatever. Listen, Psalm 90, verse, it's in Psalm 90. Lord, teach us, Psalm 90, verse 12. Lord, teach us to number our days. Why? So that we may gain a heart of wisdom, so that we may have an understanding of how short and how frail our lives are here on this earth. Think about the story of the rich man in Luke chapter 12. Jesus tells a parable. Listen to the parable of the rich man in Luke 12, 16. Jesus tells them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store all my crops. And he said, I'll do this. I'll tear down my barns, build larger ones. And there I will store all my grains and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him on that very day, you fool, this night your soul will be required of you. And the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. What's the parable of the rich man? What's Jesus reminding us of here? Regardless of our status or what we have in this world, regardless of anything that we've accumulated, tomorrow it could be gone. Today it could be gone. The most important thing that we have is our time, and more importantly than our time is how we use our time. Church, time is short. Do you have a biblical perspective of time? Do you understand what James is saying here in James 4? Your life is a mist, it's a vapor, it's a shadow. Even if you live to be 85, 105, your life is a vapor. Are there any people in this room that are older than me that would just go ahead and give me a witness this morning that life goes fast? Thank you. Point number two, we must be time tellers in order to have a clear perspective on the mission. And thirdly, finally... We must be teachable teachers. Chad, I'm not a teacher. What are you talking about? Listen, in James, the study through James, we found in James chapter 3 and in James chapter 4 that really anyone who is in Christ, who believes in Jesus, at our very most fundamental level, we're all teachers. We are all proclaimers of God's word. We're all teachers. So what James is saying here, look at verses 16 and 17. He says, as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. James is saying, listen, people, you boast in your arrogance. This word there in the original language has the characteristic, literally, and if you do a study here of the the word in the context of that day, it has the characteristic of what one Bible scholar says, of a wandering quack, a person who just roams around, but they're crazy, telling people weird things, telling people things that are untrue. This arrogant person is a wandering quack. The person who offers, perhaps they offer cures for things that don't work, or they boast in things that they want to do, but they're not able to do them. You see, church, point number three, we must be teachable teachers. Learn this. Arrogance always leads to ignorance. Arrogance always leads to ignorance. Think about it. Who are the worst teacher, worst boss, (laughs) the worst pastor, oh me, that you've ever had, they all have one thing in common, I promise you. They all are arrogant. 
They think they know it all, but they don't practice what they preach or what they teach or what they ask you to do. And Paul explicitly talks about this in Romans chapter 2. He says, if you yourselves are teachers, if you're a guide to the blind, a light to those in darkness, an instructor to the foolish, a teacher of children, having the law and the knowledge of the truth, you then who teach, why don't you do it yourself? While you preach against stealing, you steal. You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, you dishonor God by breaking the law. Wow, what perspective, church. We must kill our arrogance, and then we must do the right thing by submitting and humbling ourselves to the Lord and saying, Lord, show me your ways. Why? Go back to your text. Look at verse 17. Because whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it's what? Sin. Ooh. Ooh. So sin is a word that we don't... If you're watching online for the first time today, I'm Chad. Welcome. Sin is a word that we talk about here every week. We don't boast in it. All right? Don't, don't misunderstand any of my heart. But the reason we talk about sin every week, oh boy, here we, we could go on forever and you guys got to beat the Methodists to lunch. <laughs> the reason we talk about sin every week is because sin is what nailed our Savior to the cross. Sin is the great gap, the chasm that we couldn't cross that separated us from a holy and perfect creator. That's what sin is. Sin is what you inherited. It's what I inherited when we were born into a sinful world because of Genesis chapter three, verse six. Sin is what separates us from God. Sin is what nailed Jesus to the cross. Sin is what Christ triumphantly, victoriously bore the wrath of God on our behalf. Sin is what no longer has, come on church, dominion over you, but sin is what keeps us. It's what causes us to fall into the trap of the world. It's what causes us to do what Paul says in Romans chapter 7, these very things I want to do, I don't do because the weight of the flesh holds me back. Church, that sin, sin is a real thing. Sin needs to be talked about every day, every week. We need to talk about sin every day, not because we want to boast in it or not because we want to do it, but because sin is what has separated us from God and sin is what sent our Savior to the cross and by His grace we have been set free. Therefore, therefore, James says to whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. Jesus enlightens us in another parable in Luke chapter 12. He talks about the faithful and the wise manager in Luke 12. Listen to this parable. Jesus says, who then is the faithful and wise manager whom his master will set over his entire household to give them their portion of food at the proper time? Blessed is he, that servant, for whom his master will find doing so when he comes back. All right, story. Jesus says, Here's a, here's a wise manager. The master over the house gives them their portion of food at the proper time. Blessed is the servant whom his master will find doing what he asked him to do when the master comes back. It's pretty straightforward. Then it goes on. Jesus says, but when the master returns, mm, that servant who knew his master's will but did not get ready or act according to his will, he will receive a severe beating. But the one who did not know and did, did what it d deserved a beating, he will receive a light beating because everyone to whom much has been given of him, much will be what? Required. And from him they, who they entrusted much, they will demand even more. Church, here's the truth of the Bible this morning. Greater light, greater truth, greater knowledge brings greater responsibility. Oh, me. As we've said so many times, everyone who is a follower of Jesus is a teacher of Jesus. When we understand the truth of the Bible, when we understand what James is talking about here in James 4, when we understand that our sin has, has separated us from God, it's what caused us to, be, to, to need a Savior, all of those truths, when we understand that and then we understand the Word of God and how we are to live and how we are to walk, when we don't do what we're supposed to do, it's not just a mistake or a mess up. And oh, by the way, it's not somebody else's fault, mama, daddy, teacher, grandma, mama, papa's fault. It's my fault. And it's not only my fault, it's my sin. Oh, me. Church, do we have the perspective of being a teachable teacher? If we're going to be on the mission of God, we have to be teachable from God. If we're going to be on the mission of Jesus, we have to be teachable from Jesus. Remember this, church. People who fulfill the mission of Jesus will be lifelong learners. 
We never figure it all out. But if we fall into arrogance, into pride, as James warns about, you, you boast in your arrogance. He says that's evil. But if we take what we've learned and we've heard from our Lord and we practically apply it and say, Lord, give us, give us the ability to, to put on the armor and to put on the shoes for our feet that are ready to take us out and speak your gospel. If we walk in his ways and in his truth, he will guide us. We take the message of Jesus. We live on mission for Jesus because we know that we have a clear message. We know that we have a clear mission. We know that we have a clear vision. The question this morning is, do we have a clear and proper perspective of the mission? Here's the walk away. Number one, am I fulfilling Jesus's mission by speaking the truth? Mm. Number two, it's very straightforward and simple. Do I understand that life is short? And then number three, simply this, do I have a teachable spirit? Mm. So church, as we conclude in just a moment, I'm gonna pray for us and we get to, to celebrate on our way out the door or right before we walk out the door, we get to celebrate three baptisms this morning. Yeah, that's awesome. But before we get to that kind of high note, which it is, and it's great and awesome, let's reflect on this truth from this morning. Our perspective on the mission. As we go about our mission, we need to understand that speaking truth is what God has called us to, that our time is certainly short, and that we must be moldable, pliable vessels that God can use. Would you pray with me this morning? as we consider this truth and ask God to apply it to our lives. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this morning. Thank you for just, just the clear description that James gives us of how we are to walk and what you've called us to. So Lord, remind us of this truth today as we walk out these doors this week, as we go about our lives, our business, our homes, our schools, our whatever. Lord, remind us to be teachable, to be humble, to speak truth, not in a hateful way or not with an agenda that makes us look better in some way, but with a heart that desires people to know you and to know your love for them. So Father, if there's anyone here this morning that doesn't know you, doesn't know Jesus as their Savior, that their sins have not been forgiven through the perfect sacrifice of Jesus, Lord, today's the day of salvation. And so we pray as, as, as we wind down this time today, Lord, that you would just draw people to yourself, speak to our hearts, and Lord, just be glorified in all that we say and all that we do in Jesus' name, amen. Church, Keenan is, is going to make his way down forward, down front, and I'm going to walk down these steps. Um, they're pretty steep, but I'm going to try it. Uh, and we've got three baptisms right up front. Where is, I just saw him a minute ago. Is Keenan still here? There he is. Keenan, come on in. Come on in. He's going to introduce our all three of our uh, baptizees this morning. And then I'm gonna join him and baptize a couple at the very end. Isn't it such a just a beautiful morning to be in the house of the Lord? Y'all, today it's so great because uh, we actually get to baptize family, um, and, and it's so awesome uh, to be able to do that. So I'm actually going to let them uh, just introduce, say their names, and uh, yeah, let's do it. I'm Shayla. I'm Jace. I'm Ray. All right, so Shayla, if you want to go ahead and... Step in as Pastor Chad comes down here to hold this mic for me. All right, Shayla, who is it that you are placing your faith? and trust in and making Lord of your life. Jesus Christ. Let's go. Based upon your profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I think I can go. Can I go hands free? Yeah. 
There we go. All right. Jace, welcome. Good morning, Jace. I asked Jace this morning, I said, Jace, how old are you? He said, I'm 11 years old. So, Jace, what grade does that mean are you, that you're in right now? Fifth. Seventh? Fifth. Oh, fifth. Okay, okay. <laughs> All right. I was in second grade when I was 11. Anyway, Jace, wow, what a privilege this morning, buddy. What a privilege. You know, the Bible tells us, Jesus says, do not keep the little children from me. And so every time that, that a young man or young woman is baptized, it's just a beautiful reminder of Scripture. So, Jace, I have the privilege to ask you a question this morning as Keenan asked Shayla. Jace, who is it that you are putting your faith and your trust in for salvation this morning? Jesus, Jesus Christ. Amen. So if you'll just get your hand cover right there, right there. There we go. So, Jace, it's my privilege to baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with baptism and raised to walk in newness of life. Okay, Ray. All right. All right. I told Ray this morning I'm not going to ask you what your age is. Anyway. (laughs) I told you. Yeah, he did tell me. Anyway, church, what a blessing, Ray. Wow, what a privilege to to be able to spend this time with you today. And just as an example of what Christ has done for you, you're following in believers' baptism, showing the world that you have been buried with Christ in, in sin. You've been raised to walk in newness of life. So I'll ask you the same question this morning, Ray. Who is it that you're placing your faith and trust in this morning? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Amen, brother. Let's cover your mouth there. There we go. So, Ray, it's my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with him in believer's baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. Awesome, man. Church, let's stand to our feet. Stand to our feet. Let's stand to our feet. Church, we love you. We're so thankful that you're with us today. Have a wonderful day. Have a great week. When you see Ray and Shayla and Jace, say hello and welcome them and tell them how thankful you are for their testimony. Have a great day. We'll see you soon.